Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful instrumental. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the sanctuary. Amen. Welcome home. Yeah, I heard that, Ralph. We're glad, so glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, I'm looking around to make sure everybody's in their assigned seat. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm so used to looking around. Hey, you're supposed to be on this seat right here. Like we used to do in the lunchroom at, at school, it'd be like, hey, you're sitting in the wrong spot over here at the lunch table. You know? We're so glad you, that you're come here this morning to worship with us. I might ask Brother Chuck if he would come up and uh, lead us in prayer at this time. Chuck. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Lord, that we can actually come back to our sanctuary and worship you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you look over this congregation, this church, Lord. May we continue to do your work like we have in the past, Lord. I pray for each and every family that is represented here today, the church, the staff, everything that goes on in your house, Lord. Lord, let us not forget that we get to come to church. We don't have to come to church, Lord. Lord, I think that this past year has opened a lot of hearts and, and minds about this, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you pray over each and every one of us. <clears throat> in God's holy name, I pray. Amen. <coughs> Right, just a couple of announcements before we get our service started here. Uh, we've been asked to remind you there are offering plates in the back here on both of the tables back there. And if you don't use those in the back, we've also still got the box available on the door on the back side of the church there. So that'll be for our offering for the next X amount of weeks or however long we're going to continue doing that part of it. Also, all of our children here today... Uh, when we start the congregational song service, uh, Chuck and Alyssa sitting up over here. Uh, you need to go back to the back with them uh, when we start the congregational singing. We have a real special treat this morning. We have one heart in the building. Yeah, they're right over there. And uh, anyway, they're going to open up our service. But I want to say this to you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will I'm gonna try it again. Let's put it on at this time, all right? This is the day the Lord has made. We will. Amen. One heart, are y'all ready? They're going to open up. Come on up. That leads us up to heaven We can travel it Holding his nail scarred hand Jesus will lead us Safely up to heaven When it's time To leave this sinful land I'm on the road I am on the road That leads to glory road That leads to glory it's the heavenly road I'm traveling on. I am traveling on. It's the road. It's the heavenly road that leads to glory. Road that leads to glory. I am heading to my heavenly home. When I started out up on this journey. I began it on my knees in prayer, and there I offered all my heart to Jesus, while he leads me as I'm traveling there. I'm on the road, I'm on the road, that leads to glory, that leads to glory. it's our heavenly road, I'm traveling on, I am traveling on. Road that leads to glory. 
I am heading to my heavenly home. I'm on the road. I am on the road. That leads to glory. That leads to glory. It's that heavenly road I'm traveling on. I am traveling on. It's the road. It's that heavenly road that leads to glory. That leads to glory. I am heading to my heavenly home. It's that heavenly road, that road that leads to glory. I am heading to my heavenly, my heavenly home. Until you seek his face The answer's right before you At the foot of the cross You'll find that it's a holy place Confess your sin and lay them all down Pick up your cross Let Jesus turn your life around And you'll find grace Grace at the foot of the rugged cross on Calvary Grace with the awesome power set the captive free. Sustaining grace, redeeming grace, fulfilling, indwelling grace. His loving grace. Yes, I found grace. Amazing grace to meet my need. Well, I found grace. Grace at the foot of the rugged cross on Calvary. Grace with the awesome power to set the captive free. Sustaining grace, redeeming grace, fulfilling, indwelling grace, His loving grace. Grace, amazing grace, I found grace, amazing grace, I found grace, amazing grace to meet my need. I found grace. Thank you, One Heart. They'll be coming back in the service a little bit later on. If you would, all of our kids, come on up front. So, Chuck, I'll remember that because I'm not used to doing that for the last year and two months, all right? Anyway, all of our kids, come up and join Brother Chuck. And y'all all stand with me. And we're going to continue our worship service by singing a medley of songs. We're going to start out with Blessed Be the Name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be 
excited about? I can see a screen back there. Because <laughs> for the last year and two months, I've had 45 bookings. Y'all ever seen my stand across the stage? That's making all those changes. And now I look up there and Katie's got my back. And I'm seeing all the words now. I even took my glasses off. I can see the screen back there. Amen. All right, let's continue on with our worship service. We're going to sing the song, We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise. <laughs> Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and we all. Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up Says our joy. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. looking around the congregation and I'm looking at people looking at other people and guess what they're looking at are you going to clap or are you going to clap I don't know are you going to clap because we're going to go back and sing the chorus of this and when it says he has made me glad twice I feel like I'm back in music class alright we're going to clap twice on that y'all know what to do alright I'm sorry y'all don't want to clap I know you are, too, man. <laughs> All right, here we go with the chorus. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Let's talk about this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's sing that one more time. 
This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord has made. Everybody said, Amen. You may have a seat. Before I bring one heart back up here, I'm going to introduce our special guest speaker today. His name is Brother Jared Grimes, and he comes over from Woodmont Baptist Church. He's their youth pastor over there, and he even brought his dad this morning with him. Uh, so this is Brother Jim up here. Brother Jim Grimes, I got that right, Jim and Brother Jim, okay. But anyway, One Heart is going to come up and do another song for us, and then uh, Brother Jerry will introduce our special guest. When Jesus was here, he gave us the words of eternal life. He gave us his peace, and he said he'd not leave us alone. And though I wasn't there when the multitude watched him ascend, two angels in white announced he would come back again. Why? a blessing it was to be part of that crowd gathered there that day just to see him go up and in clouds see him taken away But I know in my heart that a greater blessing waits now for me. Because I am part of that crowd that's been watching the skies faithfully. My eyes shine. King Jesus, when he comes in clouds of glory, if I am sleeping, I'll be awakened from the grave. And if I shall remain, trumpets joyful sound I didn't see him go up but I'll see him when he comes down I'll be like him 
be like him. Though I don't know just what I'll be, I'll be like him. I'll be like him. I'll be like him. Though I don't know, no, just just what I'll be. I'll be I'll be like him, I shall see him as he is, and that's good enough for me. of glory if i am sleeping i'll be awakened from the grave and if i shall remain i'll hear the trumpet's joyful sound Thank y'all for that. Good morning. morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me. The book of 1 John, chapter 5. 1 John, chapter 5. We're going to look at one verse, and then we're going to jump around a couple of verses. I told my dad, um, this is just like the church I grew up in as a kid, so I, I know I've probably don't know a, a single person here, um, but it kind of feels like home. And the unfortunate thing was I didn't get saved at a young age when I was a child. Uh, eight years ago, just a little bit about me before I start, eight years ago I was a drunk. I left my wife, and uh, all I cared about was uh, drinking and partying. Uh, I was a violent person. I was a very selfish person. Um, I was in the military at the time, and God saved me in a barracks room in Korea. And he changed my life. He transformed the way I think, the way I talk, the way I love my wife, and thank God he restored my marriage. Uh, Gave us two beautiful children, a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old little girl. Uh, My wife wishes she could be here today. Uh, But I share that with you before I start, um, just because I want you to know I'm transformed. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor anytime I'm asked to speak or preach 
anywhere um, that God would use somebody like me uh, to stand up in the pulpit and preach his word. It uh, doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to me, um, but I just want to be faithful uh, to his word. Thank you for allowing me to come and visit with you. Um, I want to talk about this subject this morning. How can I know that I have eternal life? How can I know that I have eternal life? 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, we love to know things. We want to know exact plans. We want to have itinerary when we go somewhere. We want to know what's happening next week, next month, next year. We want to plan things out as far as we can. And we know this past year has kind of wrecked that. If you're a planner, man, everything just kind of went up in smoke as far as plans. We like to plan things. We like to know things. But here's the thing. A ton of people never plan for eternity. The song they just sang, that we'll see him when he comes back. Some people aren't ready for that. Have you ever thought about where you'll spend eternity? Most people may give it a thought or two, but they move on to what's going on in their life. We were at the ball field all day yesterday, and we love it. Had a good time. But, man, that's not important. I'm thankful to coach with two guys that we want to be godly examples for the boys, and that's the only reason we coach. We want to help them get better at baseball, but we want to be godly examples for them, and we pray that they come to know Christ uh, through something we share with them. We pray that we share the gospel clearly with them. Uh, people plan for different things. We worry about all these different things, and some people just simply don't want to think about it. Well, just because you put it out of your mind or put it off doesn't mean that it's not coming. Listen to me, vacation, trips, ball schedules, holidays, they all come and go. But eternity, as we know, is forever. You're going to spend eternity in one or two places, in heaven, worshiping Jesus or in hell, apart from Christ's love. Don Whitney, in his book, How Can I Know That I'm a Christian, tells this story. He says, on September 13, 1858, the steamship Austria caught fire and sank in the Atlantic. And it killed all but 89 of the 542 passengers that were there. And one survivor told how he and five other Christians stood there as the ship was on fire in the ocean in front of them. And they talked about at just the right time that they would have to jump. And when that time arrived, they joined hands. They looked at each other, and just before jumping into the cold waters of the Atlantic, they expressed confidence that in just a few moments, they were going to be with Jesus, and they were going to see each other again. What a beautiful way to meet death. What a joyful thought to imagine that you're going to enter heaven in just a few moment, moments with family or friends. Most of all, what a wonderful thought that at, at the moment of death that you can have confidence that I'll be with Jesus. Some of us say, well, man, I think I know. I, I'm pretty certain I know. I, I sat in a church pew man, my whole life until I got saved and I tried to convince myself that I was a Christian because I walked down, I prayed a prayer, I was baptized numerous times and the only thing about any of those professions was I was scared to go to hell. I didn't want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I didn't want to give my life to him. I had false assurance and the book of 1 John is written for us so that we can know that we know Jesus. Most people say that they're saved, and many may think they, they are, just like I did. They believe they're going to heaven, but the Bible presents another picture, and Jesus says that many will enter the wide gate that leads to destruction, and only a few will enter the narrow gate. A lot of people have false assurance, but then there are also a lot of genuine Christians, and you may be one of them, that struggle when it, with intense bouts of doubt. You just go back and forth and say, man, what if I wasn't sincere enough? What, what if I didn't really understand enough? What if I didn't believe for the right reasons? And I pray, I pray this week, I pray this morning, that whichever one you fall into, if you have false assurance, I pray God opens your eyes to this message. If you're struggling with doubts, I pray God gives you peace, the assurance that you can have in him, knowing that you're going to be with him when we pass away. John Piper said to believe is to recognize that our value is nothing compared to Jesus' value. 
Instead, we just want to know him, we want to be with him, we want to enjoy him, we want to follow him, and we want to celebrate him. That change of heart, that transition from ourselves to Christ, it means we're embracing all that he is and don't look to ourself anymore, but look to him. That's what faith is. That's what belief is. That's what saves. I want to go briefly over five tests that I believe the book of 1 John gives us to know that we know him. Now there, are, I've preached this sermon in two parts, and there are ten tests that you can go through 1 John, but we're just going to look at five this morning real quickly. And the first test is going to be in chapter 1, so if you'll flip back to chapter 1. We're going to look at verse, verse number 3. Chapter 1, verse number 3 in 1 John. says in chapter 1, verse number 3, What we have seen and heard we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So test number 1 is do you enjoy fellowship with God the Father and Christ the Son? Now, I ask you as we walk through this, be open. Open your heart and, and seriously examine yourself and ask yourself, is this me? Am I really saved? What is fellowship? Fellowship means that we share in things. We're partakers. We're partners. The Christian is one who has become a sharer in the life of God. We share in his interest and in his great purpose. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this means that we've become interested and being partners with God's plan, great plan of salvation and his attitude towards life in this world and all of its wonderful provisions. It seems to me that we cannot truly be Christians unless we're really interested in what God's doing in this world. If we have fellowship with him, if we love him, we're going to be interested in what he's doing. We're going to come in here wanting to worship, wanting to sing great praises to his name. Now, I know you're not going to be excited all the time. There'll be mornings you're tired. There'll be days that you... You would rather sleep in. That doesn't mean you don't love the Lord. But if we have fellowship with him, we're going to be excited about what he's doing. 1 John is speaking of knowing God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. This is a central message of the gospel, the whole object, the ultimate goal of all Christian experience. Do you want the presence of God in your life or only what God can offer? Some people will gladly take happiness, peace of mind, security, health, all the things that they think God can offer him. But they don't want him to be Lord of their life. To know someone, there's an intimacy, a knowledge of that person. There's nothing distant. It's like that of a husband and a wife. To know God and have fellowship with him, it means we delight in him. We have joy in his presence. It means we desire to speak with him and have the ability to do just that. Listen, if we love someone... We're in a relationship with them. We want to be around them. We want to talk to them. It's not difficult to talk to a person that we love. We don't have to try to make ourselves have a conversation with them. If we love someone, we enjoy talking to them. If we love someone, we want to tell them over and over, and we want to express by our actions, hey, I love you. These are the ways that I love you. I'm thankful for you. I know that from experience. I didn't love my wife. We've been married 12 years. And for the first four years of our marriage, I didn't love her. And I've told her that. It wasn't hard to see. I wanted to be everywhere else. I wanted to drink. I wanted to be out with friends. I didn't want to be with her. I liked the thought of being married to her. But I didn't take time to tell her I love her. Most importantly, I didn't take time to show her that I loved her. I may have said, yeah, I love you. My action showed something totally different. Paul expressed what this knowing, what this true fellowship meant to him personally. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live in faith by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul experienced the presence of God in his own life so much so that he said, look, I'm not even the one that lives anymore. Christ is the one that lives in me, and my life is completely his to do what he wants. I've given everything up to him. I've given total control to him to do what he wants with me. Listen to me. Let me ask you, is that your experience? Does Christ live in and through you? Do you experience 
His presence in your life. If we're truly Christians, we should be walking with God, we should be speaking to Him, delighting to praise Him, and anxious to know more about Him. And not only fellowship with Him, man, we should love coming together with other believers. I didn't say you're going to love every one of them dearly. But I love being around believers. Man, I love people that I can talk to about what God is doing in our lives. I love to just say how thankful I am for what God is doing in my life. So that's test number one. Do you have fellowship with God? Test number two. Look at verse 6 through 8 in chapter 1. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and we're not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. Test number two, are you sensitive to sin? Is there an awareness and a confession of sin in your life daily? Do you know when you sin? John is saying here in this passage and throughout the book that a verbal profession needs to be tested to see if a person's behavior actually shows that he's been affected. Has there been a change in your life? Those that say they love God and walk around in sin or in darkness, he says you're liars. And you're not practicing what you preach. It was a common problem, and the reason why John wrote this letter was because there were false teachers that were saying that you could live however you want, do whatever you want, and still be saved. John is saying, listen, that's a lie. That is a lie. And I'm writing this book so you'll know. Listen, that wasn't just back then. This is what we still deal with today. I would come to church every Sunday. Man, my dad made me go to church, and I'm thankful for that. Because if my mom and dad hadn't made me go to church, when I was 29 years old in that barracks room in Korea, I didn't hear a sermon. I knew the gospel. Because I had been in church and I had heard it over and over. I was by myself, just me and God. And I prayed and asked him to save me. I knew all the answers. I knew the right things. I just didn't have a relationship with him. Heard a story about a known drug dealer in a community. And he was killed and the pastor stands up to, to do the funeral. And he had the audacity to say that he knew this guy was in heaven. And don't misunderstand me here. I'm not judging that this is how the story went. But he had the audacity to tell everybody in the, in the auditorium that this guy, known drug dealer, uh, was going to heaven. And he said he knew that because this guy gave his life to Christ 20 years ago at a vacation Bible school. He raised his hand. He walked an aisle. And in that 20 years, there had been no repentance. There had been no change of life. He may have been to church a few times. And you may be saying, well, how do you know that, that he wasn't saved? I know because the Bible tells me that you won't walk in sin if you've been changed by the blood. I'm telling you, I used to love that stuff that I mentioned to you, the drinking, the partying, I was violent, I would fight, I would do all kind of stuff. And I used to love that stuff. And it makes me sick to think about it now. I have a new nature. I no longer want to do that stuff. If you've been changed, you won't walk the way you used to walk. You can't do it. The Bible says there's no way. There will be an awareness of sin, a confession of sin, and your life will be changed. We've got to get past this belief that just because somebody makes a public profession that they're saved, what does their life say about it? The way they live will show you if a person's saved. The way you live will show you if you're saved. Now, I'm not saying that we won't sin occasionally, but we won't continue to walk in it and love it and wallow in it. The Bible doesn't speak of that. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, John speaks to this too as he's talking about these false teachers that one time professed to be believers. In verse 19, don't turn over there, but in verse 19 of chapter 2, he says they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so it might be made clear that none of them belong 
to us. These people professed to be believers. They removed themselves from the fellowship with community of believers. They didn't want to be around Christians. They lived in open disobedience to God. And it gave evidence that they were never really changed by the gospel and they weren't believers. As a believer, we are very much aware of sin in our lives. And we hate it. We definitely don't want to do anything sinful. We don't want to live in that. Characteristics of an unbeliever are this. They're oblivious to sin in their lives. They don't feel a lot of concern or really notice the sin that's going on in their life. In, th in fact, if you ask them, everything's going great. They have no sin. They want to redefine what sin is and what it's not. And they'll look at the Bible and they'll say, well, that's not really what the Bible means, so I'm just going to choose to ignore that and live my own way. Some get the idea that if they don't rape, kill, steal, and are faithful to their spouse, then everything's okay. But on the other hand, the characteristics of a believer is that we're very much aware of sin. We feel convicted about sin. We hate it when we sin. There's an unsettled feeling. There's no peace when the believer continues in sin until they confess it. The believer knows that they must confess sin. The genuine mark of a true believer is continual confession of sin. That's just saying that we agree that what God says is right and that we need forgiveness for it. You can read Romans 7 and listen to how a believer will stumble in sin sometimes. Paul, Paul gives you how, how a believer will stumble in sin but they'll very much hate it. He was aware of it. And Paul says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? And I know some of you are, are like that today. I'm like that often. I look at my life, and if I'm not careful, I'll look at present day and say, man, I, I should be further along in this journey by now. I should be more mature as a believer. But then I look back. The Lord takes me back, and I look back at how far he's brought me, and I'm like, my goodness. It seems like so long ago. So if you're struggling with sin here today, listen, I'm not, I'm not telling you you're not, a you're not a believer. I'm telling you, Paul knows this. Paul says, why do we do the things that we don't want to do? We do that sometimes. But we'll want to repent. We'll want that out of our life. He wanted so badly to live for Christ. And what was happening as he grew closer to God, the sin in his life became more apparent and it became evident, and he was so badly wanting to repent and get rid of it. An unbeliever will sin and continue to sin and have no remorse at all. A believer will still sin. We all know that, right? I'm sure we could stand up and confess things we've done this week that we wish we hadn't have done, that we wish we hadn't have said. But we want to repent. We're remorseful. We, we want to tell people we're sorry. We want to tell God we're sorry that we sinned against him. That's the difference. Are you aware of the spiritual battle raging within you? Are you willing to confess your sins to God as he makes you aware of them? If this is you, then scripture shows you, then yes, you are a true believer. Test number three. Chapter two, jump down a few verses. Chapter two, verses three through six, it says, this is how we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and yet does not keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know that we're in him. The one who says, I remain in him should walk just as he walked. Test number three, do you obey God's word? And what this is talking about right here, is it a habit of your life to obey his commands. That is to love his word, to want to obey, not just every once in a while, but if you look at your life big picture, do you have a lifestyle of obedience to Christ's word? Now, now again, we're not going to do this perfectly, certainly not. But we desire, we will desire to obey his word if we're genuine believers. The Bible says when we're born again that we're new creations, and that means the old life is gone. The new life is here, and guess what? A new life means new things, right? We don't do the old things. For a believer, one of those new things is obedience to God's Word. So what does he command? What is it that we're supposed to obey? Well, for starters, we're to do as Christ says and live as he wants. He tells us what to do in John chapter 3, verse 23. He says, believe in my name, 
Believe in the name, excuse me, of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. Believe in the name of the son Jesus Christ and love one another. So true Christian faith results in loving behavior. If we're believers, we're going to love people. But commands is plural, so it also means that everything else that God had to say in his word. It's not selective obedience where we get to pull a verse here or pull a verse there that, that we're kind of good at. It's all of Scripture. These commands encompass all of Jesus' words and teaching. You say, well, hold on. The Bible says we're all sins, and we all sin. That's real difficult to do, and you're exactly right. It is hard, and we do all sin. But I want you to listen to what else John says in chapter 5, verse 3. He said, for this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. But then there's this. His commands are not a burden. They're not a burden to the believer. We don't have a, a, a checklist and wake up every morning and say, okay, I've got to read my Bible for a few minutes. I've got to pray. I've, I've, I've got to go to church this week. I like what the guy said earlier. We get to go to church. Man, we get to read the Bible. We get to pray and spend time with God. We get to love on people. We get to serve people. That's the difference. Man, it should be a joy, a blessing for us to do these things. Now, I know we're not always going to feel like it. But those of you that serve people know, even when you don't feel like it, when you say, you know what, I'm going to be obedient, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Man, we'll get the biggest blessing of all. Do we love people? There was a time in my life where I looked at the Bible as a set of rules. And I thought, man, if I can do all this stuff, I, I can feel good about myself and I won't go to hell. When Jesus saved me, he began to change my desires. And now I want to do whatever he wants me to do. Do I do that perfectly? Absolutely not. But I'm disgusted by sin. I hate it with everything in me. And I do a lot of repenting. My little seven-year-old son wanted to come with me today. And I, I think I'm going to start bringing him. I, I wish I had now. And I tell this story sometimes when, when I talk about me repenting. I try to be open with people in our congregation because I, I had this false uh, impression when I was young and it was just my thinking. I, I don't think anybody did anything to, to make me think this, but I thought preachers and people that stood up in the pulpit, I thought they didn't struggle with sin. I thought they didn't struggle with anything. I thought they were perfect. I thought that was the model that you were supposed to live by. And I found out in ministry as I, as I get up and preach, man, I need to tell people, like, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. I have to repent. I have to do this. I'm human just like everybody else. So I try to tell my son. I try to get down on one knee and tell him when I'm wrong. And I'm wrong a lot. And I want him to know that, Daddy, listen, Daddy's not perfect. So I'll get down on my knee and I'll tell him, Son, I'm sorry. I sinned against you. I got angry. And I'm sorry. And kids are quick to forgive, man. They'll forgive you and, and throw their arms around your neck and love you. And we should be more like that. But he told me one day, I did that, and he said, uh, Daddy, you sure do a lot of repenting. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I, I do. I sure do. And I said, I'll keep doing a lot of repenting because I was trying to get him to understand what repenting was and why I asked him for forgiveness. And I do say I'm sorry a lot. But I think that's the awareness of sin in my life. John says that we can be confident that we're believers if we keep God's commands. But here's the catch. We can't do this by ourselves. You say, well, hold on, you just told me in order to have assurance of salvation, we've got to keep the commands. Now you're telling me we can't keep the commands. No, I'm saying keeping commands is not a condition of knowing God, but a sign that we do know God. We're not doing this to try to gain entrance into heaven. We're doing this out of the overflow of our heart. Verse 6 says, the one who remains in him or abides in him should walk as he walked. Remains or abides means Depend completely on Jesus. This is how we obey the commands. We're completely dependent on Jesus and the Holy Spirit to change our heart, to guide us, to give us the grace to be obedient. Listen, I'll have people call me all the time and say, man, how'd you stop drinking? Man, how'd you stop being angry? How'd you stop being violent? How'd you stop all these things? How do you love your wife now? And I think they're looking for a, a, a formula or, or something, and I say, man, I... To be honest with you, sometimes my mind is blown. I got saved and Jesus changed everything about me. He, he, 
he began to take the desire for alcohol away. He began to take the anger away. I'm not perfect in these things by no means, but it's not anything that I've done. He's changed the desire of my heart, and I've got to look along the way and see, man, that's pretty awesome that he does that when we finally just surrender our lives and say, you know what, I, Lord, I give up. I'm going to trust you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to do whatever you want me to do for you. He changes our desires. The Greek word keep is translated, and it means watchful or careful or thoughtful obedience. So when Jesus saves us, he produces in us a willing obedience. It is not done because we have to, but now because we want to. We love him. What is internal will eventually come to the surface. If you know God, then your life will be marked by obedience to his word. I didn't say sinless perfection. That's not going to happen. But the question is, do you desire to obey the word of God? out of gratitude for all he's done for you? Do you desire to love him out of gratitude? Nobody's going to keep every command, but what I'm asking you, is: does that desire produce an overall pattern of obedience in your life? We'll go through these last two quick. Test number four. Chapter 2, verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Test number four, do you love God or do you love the things of the world? John warns us, don't love the world or the things in the world. Why? Because all of this is passing away. None of it will matter in eternity. A good way to think is don't worship what will not last. And all these things on this earth that we're tempted to worship, they're not going to last. And I have to tell myself that because I, I'm, I'm a sports guy. Uh, I love sports. And the guy I coach with, he played ball at UNA. Uh, the other guy that we coach with, he, is, he loves sports as well. And I pray for all of us. I say, God, help this not become an idol because you can get caught up in it. Uh, I'm sure some of you could tell me stories upon stories of, of your children. When your child's out there, Man, you can get caught up in it easy, and it's, it's easy to lose perspective of what matters. But, but I pray every day because I know how I am, and I ask God, guard my heart and help this not become an idol. Help me use this to share the gospel with people. He gives us some examples of the temptation we'll face. He says the lust of the flesh, and that's just the tendency of human beings to fulfill the natural desires that they have that are con contrary to the word. We sin because we're sinful. We willingly choose to participate in sin. This is our natural tendency and desire. When we come into this world, the only remedy for that is to become a child of God through faith in Christ. The next thing is the lust of the eyes. He says we're, we have a tendency to be captivated by the outward show of things. The lust of the eyes tempts us, us to focus on enjoyment in the present without thinking about future ramifications. That is why people struggle with alcohol. That's why people struggle with drugs. That's why people struggle with pornography. They only think about the here and now and don't think about what it's doing to them. The pride of life or, or pride in one's possessions. In this area of temptation, individuals make idols of their livelihood, their social standing, or other status symbols that the world determines are more important than God, but they actually mean very little to God. To love God means we're solely focused on doing the will of the Father here on earth. We're not concerned about our own desires, but we want to do what God wants us to do. To love the world means the exact opposite. It means you're only focused on the pleasures and gratifications that you can have right now, and you'll worry about everything else later. In this year, man, I've seen our pastor do I don't know how many funerals. We just lost our secretary, the lady that's right across the hall from me, and she was 49 years old and uh, died this past week. It almost seems unreal. But as I ride with him to these different places, it again helps me put things in perspective and, and ask myself, am I spending time on the right things? Am I sharing the gospel enough? Am I worried about people's soul enough? Or am I more concerned about a baseball game or a football game or something else that's, that's not going to matter? 
Do you love the world or do you love God? Serving in the church, coming to church, standing up, singing a solo in church, being in the choir, serving as a deacon, as a youth pastor, as a preacher, whatever. That doesn't mean that you're saved. You can be as lost as somebody that never stepped foot in the church. You say, well, what do you mean? The Pharisees had confidence in keeping all the outward laws, but Jesus told them, you worship me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. They didn't love God. They liked keeping a lot of laws, a lot of rules. They wanted to look good for the people, but they had no love for God. Do you love God and reject the world, or do you love the world and try to fit God into your crowded schedule? Last test, test number five. Is sin decreasing in your life? Do you practice sin, or do you practice righteousness? Is your lifestyle marked by constant sin, or is your lifestyle marked by obedience and righteousness? In chapter 3, look at verse 4. In chapter 3, it says, Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away the sins, away sins, and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Now, this passage is talking about the practice of sin. It's not talking about sin that we commit. It's talking about a habitual lifestyle of sin. Children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin, who who practices this sin, is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. He says everyone who practices righteousness, doing what is right, conforming to God's will, has been born of him. Do you habitually sin, or do you strive to live a consistent, honorable life by submitting and surrendering to God daily? I was telling my son how to have a quiet time the other day. Now, I know he may not understand it all because he's seven, but I said the best way I knew how, I said, we come to God and and just confess to him, I need you. I need you to get through this day. Like, I don't know what's ahead of me, but I need you. I want to spend time with you because I love you and I need you. That was the best way I knew how to tell him. Are you doing that in your life? A true Christian can still sin, and sometimes frequently, but practicing sin means sin has become the regular pattern of a person's life, and true believers don't do that. Lawlessness, the word that's used in this passage, means living as if there was no law. A person who rejects God's authority doesn't care what God thinks, about his habits, and it is not a Christian. This passage tells us that we know if we're children of God or if we're children of the devil, we take on the inner character and the moral values of our Father. The one we look like is the one that the Bible tells us that we are. We've heard the old saying, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, then it's a duck. The same thing applies here, and and please hear me. This is not me being judgmental at all. This is what the Bible teaches us. The only difference here in the spiritual side is a person can look on the outside like they're doing all the right things but actually have no desire for the Lord or his commands and look nothing like God in private. If you love the Lord, there will be a desire to stop sinning. You won't enjoy it. You'll want to get rid of it. We have people in here and all around the world. You ask them if they're a believer, they'll say, yeah, I'm a believer. I made a decision. I walked down an aisle. I prayed a prayer. I did this. I did that. I made this decision. And don't say anything about Jesus saving them. They don't say anything about God drawing them or about the Holy Spirit bringing conviction, about showing them that they're a sinner or causing them to see the gospel clearly. And I think that's because a lot of people don't even know what it means to be truly converted. Jesus says it's the Holy Spirit who convicts. John 16, 8, he says when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's Jesus 
who says the Holy Spirit convicts. It's God who draws them unto salvation. John 6, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up in the last day. And Jesus alone saves. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have no evidence of being converted, you look like the world, you act like the world, and sound like the world. The Bible says you are of the world and that your father is the devil. Jesus wants you to be saved today. He wants to save you. And the greatest news that Jesus promises is eternal life if we'll repent and surrender to him. Listen, if coming to Christ is this life-changing experience, then what believers do and how we act is an indicator of whether or not our life has really changed. That there will be a distinct change in your life. Now, I don't know where you're at right now. You may be looking at me and thinking, I, I, I just want you to finish up and be done. And that's fine. I understand that. I sat in a church years and years and tried to think about anything I could to get my mind off what the preacher was saying. But I can tell you this, if the Lord's dealing with you today, come to me, come to anybody in here, you know who the faithful Christians are in here, talk with one of us, but I, 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 can, I can tell you this, I get calls all the time and say, hey, I'm coming to talk to you tomorrow. I want to come talk with you this week. And what usually happens, that person's under conviction, and I can tell. And I'm like, well, why don't we talk right now? And they say, no, I promise, I'll be by there tomorrow. And most of the time, they never come. They talk themselves out of it. They listen to lies from the devil and say, no, you're okay. You're okay. You just had a bad week. Everything's all right. Relax. Like, you don't need to be extreme like he's talking about. To be a believer is extreme. It's going to look way different from the world. So I'm asking you, if you don't know Jesus today, please come down here. I'll be down here after the service and let's make sure you know who Jesus is today. If you've struggled with doubts of salvation, I pray that that's cleared some of this up uh, and I would encourage you to just study 1 John for yourself and see what the Word says because if you're a believer, God wants you to experience that joy and, and walk in the joy of of knowing him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we've had today. I pray in here for the person that is a Christian that struggled with doubts. I pray, God, that you would give them peace. God, that your word would comfort them and they would know that they are yours. Satan wants to tell lies and bind us and, and have us confused and so that, so that we're no earthly good here. But God, I pray that, that those that struggle with doubt, that you would give them peace. God, I pray that the one that, that's not sure if they're saved, I pray that you give them the boldness to just come talk to me, talk to somebody. And God, not put it off. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you move in people's hearts. We're thankful that you and you alone can save. God, we thank you for this time of worship. Pray that you would continue to lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, our altar is open. The Holy Spirit's dealing. Will you please come forward? Brother Ryan's a covenant sweet it was written for me it's a promise that I could be from all my sin and my shame even heartache was signed and confirmed on a hill. 
so I rest my case at the cross. For now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied. Oh, I have it all, so I rest my case at the cross. Don't feel sorry for me when you see a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts, all my sin he forgives. Every trial is won through the thank you for this opportunity to come to your house again. Lord, we just thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ that atones for our sin, that Jesus Christ is the only way for salvation. Lord, we thank you for this message that we've heard that points us to the cross, Lord, and, and tells us how to, according to the Bible, how that we're supposed to abide in Christ, have the mind of Christ, and live within Christ. Lord, we love you. We just praise you for allowing us to be back into our sanctuary to worship. Lord, we thank you for our church family, for the encouragement that we feel from each one of them. And Lord, just help us to lift each other up. Lord, help each of us to draw closer to you. Lord, just give us within our hearts and mind a desire to be more like you in everything that we do and say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. 